Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to get started in just a minute here. Um, but you are in the right place if you're here to bet here. If you're here to hear about the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable Rural Development Toolkit, um, we're just going to let a few more people enter our virtual room, and then we'll get started with intros and the details about this awesome resource that ORR has put together. All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Thank you for being here. My name is Oxy Navis, and I'm the director of the New Mexico Outdoor Recreation Division within the Economic Development Department. And our goal within this office is to ensure that all New Mexicans benefit from the public health, economic, educational, environmental benefits of a robust, sustainable outdoor economy. And that really is what we're going to talk about today. So in this chair that I am honored to sit in, I field questions, I'd say at least weekly from community leaders who ask, how do we build or expand our own outdoor recreation economy, especially in a way that benefits the residents of our community? And usually my answer revolves around relationship building and storytelling and resources, including pointing people to programs within the Outdoor Recreation Division, like the Outdoor Equity Fund, and our Outdoor Recreation Infrastructure Grant. So now, thanks to the work of Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, which is the country's leading coalition of outdoor recreation trade associations and organizations, and of which New Mexico is proud to be a state member, I have an even more specific answer for those folks. Check out the Rural Economic Development Toolkit. This report, which you're gonna hear about in detail today, is the result of interviews with dozens of land managers, economic developers, business leaders, elected representatives, many of them from New Mexico, and more. It outlines, among other ideas, best practices on how to build a sustainable outdoor recreation economy in your community, and it leans into the resources on how to do just that. So joining me today to talk about the toolkit's potential are two experts in this field. First, Chris Perkins, Outdoor Recreation Roundtable Fellow and the author of the toolkit as well as Gabe Vasquez, the city councilor, a city councilor for the city of Las Cruces and founder of the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project. And we are sad, but also totally understand that Senator Hamlin is doing the very important work of legislating this morning. And so sadly, she won't be able to join us, um, but she sends her regards and we wish her the very best of luck in committee. So thank you both for being here. And I do wanna hand it off to Chris for the first 20 minutes or so to go over the toolkit in detail then Councillor Vasquez and I will answer a few questions about the impact we've seen the toolkit have here in New Mexico, the potential we think it has, and finally, we'll leave time for Q&A at the end. So please drop your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can before we wrap at 11 a.m. And with that, Chris, I'm gonna hand it off to you to talk about the impactful work you've done creating this amazing toolkit and your vision for it going forward. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Axie. As she mentioned, my name is Chris Perkins, and in addition to being a fellow at the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable, I'm also a joint degree student at the Yale School of the Environment and Yale School of Management in my last semester. And I've been very fortunate to work with the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable on various topics since last May with a special focus on rural economic development, one resource of which you'll see today. And this is actually the first presentation uh, we'll be doing on the state level and how fitting uh, to talk about New Mexico, which is a real leader, uh, both in terms of innovative strategies to promote the outdoor recreation economy, but also because New Mexico has an emphasis on getting all people outside. Um, I think about the Outdoor Equity Fund and, and other programs. So first, uh, a little bit about the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. As actually mentioned, ORR is America's leading coalition of outdoor recreation trade associations and organizations working to promote the growth of the outdoor rec economy and outdoor rec activities. 
And what we do is educate decision makers and the public on balanced policies uh, that conserve public lands and waterways and enhance infrastructure to improve the experience and quality of life of outdoor enth enthusiasts everywhere. And ORR's priorities for 2021 are to work with the new administration to support outdoor rec across all agencies to support COVID-19 recovery through the implementation of the Great American Outdoors Act, uh, to work on racial equity through increased access to outdoor recreation and growing a diverse workforce for the outdoor rec industry, connecting conservation and climate resiliency, and supporting economic recovery through tariff relief and rural economic development which is what leads to our showcase today of our new Rural Economic Development Toolkit. Before I go to the toolkit, I just wanna highlight our amazing members, um, of which the state of New Mexico is one. So now I'm going to try to transition here to Safari. Nice, looks good on my end. So, I have one more screen to move around. So this is the ORR Rural Economic Development Toolkit. And just a quick outline of the next hour, I'll spend the first 20 minutes or so walking through some major sections of the toolkit and then um, bring back AXI as well as uh, Councillor Vasquez to provide more insight on how we can build outdoor rec economies in New Mexico. And we'll have hopefully 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. So as questions arise, uh, feel free to write, write them in the box at the bottom of the screen and we'll take them at the end. So first, just some like, why this toolkit and why now? I, I, I've i got a couple anecdote, anecdotes to share that I think illustrate this well. I was talking to Rachel Schmidt, who's the former state director of Montana, did similar work to what AXI does for New Mexico. And she said, there are so many amazing rural communities in Montana, but they often come to me at step one in the process of building an outdoor rec economy. Wouldn't it be great to have a resource that would support them to get to step six or seven in the process? So that's one anecdote that was in the back of my mind as I was creating this toolkit. And the other is that in 2019, the EPA started this new program called the Recreation Economy for Rural Communities. It's a, a technical assistance program to support rural America with supporting outdoor rec economies. They had enough funding for 10 slots, but 170 communities applied. So I think both those, those anecdotes in tandem showcase why this toolkit is uh, well-timed. And I'll, I'll just point out that this resource is intended to be complementary to the work that you all do, whether it's as a community leader or an economic development official, a congressional staffer, a state official, federal agency, whatever it might be. Um, hopefully this is a great resource to have at your disposal to share with community members. And also note that this is currently in its online form but we also have it in PDF uh, to reach folks who may not have as strong of internet infrastructure. So I, I first wanna to skip to the end just to give some context on uh, how this came together. We've been fortunate to have the support of the Oregon State University Outdoor Recreation Economy Initiative, who uh, did the design work for this, as well as the National Governors Association. And basically, the process of putting it together involved a lot of conversations with practitioners like Axie and Gabe. And here's the full list of research participants. Um, and I, in putting it together, I tried to get a really broad capture of representatives um, from the state and local level to federal agencies, as well as economic development groups, outdoor businesses, and everyone in between. I don't know if Jim Glover's on the call today, but um, Jim at Once a Day Marketing in New Mexico was a great resource for this toolkit. So the central idea of this toolkit is that outdoor recreation offers opportunities for sustainable economic and community development in the United States, and particularly in rural America. But let's be honest, this work is quite complicated if you don't know where to start. So this first page is for readers to self-select into the level of knowledge that they arrive with and use the appropriate parts of the toolkit. And so if you land on this page, these rotating slides give you a nudge about the part of the toolkit, that would be the best place for you to start. 
And I'll also point out that this uh, toolkit includes a link to federal grants and technical assistance, which I've pulled up here. This document uh, was my effort basically to canvas all federal grants and technical assistance that would be supported for the development of outdoor recreation economies. So in your work, when it comes time to consider funding, uh, I hope this resource is useful. So let's talk about rural America. Rural America faces some significant challenges, whether it's a high poverty rate, depopulation, lack of critical infrastructure, and as a recent report from Headwaters Economics underscored fiscal policy that has constrained the ability of governments to grow. I'll just note here that these impacts are often more pronounced for Black, Latino, or Hispanic, and or Native American communities. And as we all know, COVID-19 has had an even more pronounced impact through various economic shutdown measures. So in this context, new diversified and, and really place-based economic development strategies are needed. At the same time, I think about this moment that we're in where COVID has clarified the value of time outdoors. The economy seems to, re to be rebounding and Americans are more comfortable traveling. Remote work is up. The current administration appears to be putting environment first, particularly through the 30 by 30 initiative to protect 30% of lands and waters by 2030. So with this moment in mind, I think we all can agree that outdoor recreation economies present a fantastic opportunity con to contribute to more resilient and sustainable economies. So this page is mostly background, but one of the things I like about this toolkit is how frequently it showcases quotes from practitioners in the field. So for instance, here, Nathan Fay, who's the director of outdoor recreation for the state of Colorado. And I'll also just point out here that no rural community is the same. Rural America is not a monolith. Um, as a result of socioeconomic status, racial or ethnic background, political affiliation, tribal status, access to natural resources, rural communities are, are different from the one next door. And so the decisions that a community make, makes around economy development must really be informed by their context. Outdoor rec is, is not a one size fits all strategy. So what do we mean when we say the outdoor recreation economy? I think it's important to clarify here. These are economies that prioritize natural and built assets within or adjacent to a community. So these could be like federal public lands, state lands, local parks, or private lands with recreation access. These are areas that enable outdoor recreation and its associated economic, social, health, and environmental benefits. And so this page outlines the outdoor rec economy and the sort of activities that we're talking about. I just wanna flag a great resource here. The Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, and their outdoor recreation satellite account has broken down on state by state level the value of outdoor recreation. So this could be a good, good place to understand the role of outdoor rec in New Mexico. And here's some top line takeaways on the value of outdoor rec. Drawing visitors who spend money at local businesses, attracting new talent and investment, increasing property values, and of course, improving quality of life and public health, particularly in low income neighborhoods. So the best practices page here is really uh, the backbone of the toolkit. It's a roadmap of sorts. These best practices are listed roughly in chronological order and can guide a community member through the process. But I also wanna emphasize that the process of building outdoor rec economies is neither turnkey nor predictable as a result of the various demographic differences that I described earlier. So communities might move through these strategies in a slightly different order, but I tried to organize these to be applicable for any community. So let's dive in. Uh, I'm gonna try to capture um, some of my favorite best practices from the toolkit, but we won't get to all of them today. So I encourage you to go to the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable website and scroll through this toolkit on your own time. So these quotes from Mark Bereka at REI, John Snyder from Washington State and Pitt Grew from Utah underscore that these economies really only take off with committed local leadership. Outdoor recreation economies are not an economic development strategy that can be parachuted in from above. This takes full-time effort. 
And as Laurel Harkness from the Society of Outdoor Recreation Professionals notes, this is a great opportunity to compensate leaders for their time. If you're someone who could be building an outdoor rec economy, but also have a business or a ranch or a family to take care of, um, this is time consuming work. And so communities can consider compensating leaders uh, to lead the charge. And throughout the toolkit, lessons from the field. Here's a great one um, showcasing the Granite Backcountry Alliance, uh, which, uh, let's see if I can open this up. Yeah, um, it, it's just a great example of a, of a development strategy that really originated from within the community, driven by a lot of volunteers who are cutting glades for backcountry skiing in New Hampshire. Consistent messaging is so important here, and we can really lump it into two buckets, economics and public health. So as you use the toolkit, hopefully the resources embedded within this page um, help with how you might convey the value of this economic potential to decision makers within your community. As I noted earlier, Outdoor Rec creates short-term support for tourism-related businesses, but also longer-term support by recruiting new residents who might be business owners, entrepreneurs, or workers, growing earning, earnings per job, and of course, the quality of life and public health benefits. One takeaway from these conversations is that we really need to make outdoor recreation a must-have, not a nice-to-have. I'm just gonna scroll to the bottom of the slide here. Um, some of you might recognize Jim Glover from New Mexico. These are four quotes from practitioners in the field about how they message uh, outdoor recreation and its potential to their communities. So Jim saying live, work, play, and stay. Ta from uh, the Pennsylvania Wild Center talking about making a community and the major employers located there more competitive. Randy Carpenter, encouraging communities to build on assets that they already have. And um, Jack Morgan, talking about thinking about the outdoor economy beyond tourism as an opportunity for outdoor assets to retain and attract a talented workforce and spark business growth in other sectors. Building collaboratives. If I had to describe a thesis statement that I left this project from, building collaboratives is it. And I wanna highlight this great quote from Steph Bertena, who facilitates that recreation economy for rural communities program at the EPA. Her quote captures it really well. It's important to mobilize a steering committee that is cross-sector, committed, and dedicated, involving representatives from the city or town, private business owners, community foundations, nonprofits, et cetera. I like this last part too, that and just having people in the community, what I call the community spark plugs, who have the dedication and oomph to keep things moving. That's what holds it together. And oh, let's see, I just lost my slide. Here we go. Uh, and on this page, I tried to capture all the sorts of representatives that um, exist within these collaboratives, whether it's on the local or regional level, state representatives, tribal representatives or federal agencies. One more thing on this page is that the value of public sector partners can't be overstated. Public sector partners um, have so much experience navigating through the sometimes challenging uh, requirements to get grants, technical assistance, or funding. And so bringing these folks to the table can often um, open a collaborative's eyes to the source of resources that a community might have available. So in, the, in this case, this is Toby Bloom from the US Forest Service, and she's their national program manager of travel, tourism, and interpretation. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to generate public support. And um, Councillor Vasquez, who you'll hear from later, is featured prominently on this page. Gabe says it really well in just a handful of, of words. Make a culturally conscious approach. Don't Im impose cultural norms across communities. I just wanna reemphasize here that rural America is not a monolith. It, it has unique characteristics because of its demographics or its political status or its tribal status or, or socioeconomics. And so 
as leaders approach communities or work within communities, they have to be very conscious of these unique histories and, and come up with place-based strategies. Here's Axie maybe talking to some of you and, and doing a great job um, building trust and support for the idea of outdoor recreation. I want to also uh, emphasize here the importance of bringing tribes to the table. The history of genocide and forcible relocation of tribes from today's public lands is horrific. And there's no easy way to repair these histories and restore justice, but one um, action that a community can take to be proactive is to invite tribes to the table to be part of the decision-making process. And to illustrate that, um, just a great example from Maine of uh, a local foundation that uh, restored stewardship to 735 acres of land to the Penobscot Nation. Just gonna go through a few more and then we'll break into our panel. Professional development opportunities are, are so critical to provide. And as Laurel Harkness notes, a lot of local leaders come into roles with little prior experience building outdoor rec economies and don't have access to professional development opportunities in the midst of their responsibilities. So on this page, I just wanted to capture some of the strategies that have been utilized to support um, leaders and communities, whether things like leadership development academies, outdoor rec incubator grants, business accelerators, grant writing training, marketing and branding conferences, et cetera. Creating a brand, this is actually a, a big takeaway from my conversation with, with Jim at Once A Day Marketing in New Mexico. And I, I think his quote um, explains it here best. Communities don't always understand branding or what that is. Communities need to understand that they already have a brand, good or bad. It may not be what they want now, but they have the ability to shape and manage the brand moving forward. At the highest level, rural communities can't be all things to all people. They're often so hungry to attract new residents and businesses. Prospects end up not being a good long-term fit or aligned with their own values and offerings. So this process of, of brand building is quite important. It allows a community to participate actively in the visioning and messaging and marketing around its outdoor recreation amenities. And a great example here from Fruit of Colorado. Funding partners. Funding is so important and a particular challenge for uh, certain rural communities. And through my interviews here, I wanted to capture all the various funding resources that have been utilized uh, to support outdoor rec economies. And each of these has a drop down. So you can get a sense of the sort of programs. And you might recall that we have this list here and, and this list is basically just a more analog form of this drop down. And um, a great example of funding rural West Virginia here, which um, doesn't have significant capital to fund outdoor recreation, but has made the most of limited resources. They have this great partnership where 10 rural towns around the Monongahela National Forest have come together to share administrative support marketing resources. And then through the following funding mix, they've been, el been able to develop an outdoor recreation brand. So we have a federal agency, two federal agencies, a private foundation, another federal agency, um, and then West Virginia University Extension Services. So I, I like citing this example to show that even in a place that's strapped for cash, um, they can still make the most of resources. Let's skip ahead. A lot of good stuff in here. And again, I encourage you to go through the toolkit on your own time. Um, for certain communities that are further along in the process, they can think about uh, attracting outdoor businesses to put down roots in their community. As Stephanie Pack puts it, the communities adjacent to outdoor recreation opportunities should be top of mind for any outdoor brand because they're the gateway through which their customer base flows. A lot of outdoor companies do manufacturing and product development in-house and want to be near training grounds and end users uh, for their products. And when I see this quote, I think a lot actually about Farmington, New Mexico, which I know is lean to lease strategies. 
And here's some examples of such uh, manufacturing programs, ways to attract businesses. Um, of course, this toolkit would be incomplete if it didn't talk openly about some of the challenges to developing outdoor rec economies. And they're basically lumped into three buckets here. Uh, and, the, and this quote captures it well. There can just be some cultural hesitation towards um, a new economic development strategy. As Sarah Schrader describes, for certain communities that have been highly reliant on uh, mineral, mineral extraction or energy development, a hundred years of boom and bust creates so much hopelessness. Even when you're in the boom cycle, you know the other shoe is going to drop. And with Gabe's words in the front of my mind, you know, a place-based, culturally conscious strategy is just so important here in the process of trust building and putting together an economy that really works for everyone. Another challenge is limited uh, administrative bandwidth in rural communities. Of course, potential leaders have existing commitments. And here's actually with a with a great quote. Some communities just don't have the resources to spearhead such a thing. Everyone has rural jobs and they don't always have the time to figure out what the blueprint would be. They're eager about outdoor recreation but don't have the capacity. And so I'll, I'll reemphasize the importance of bringing together broad collaborative to maximize best use of available federal, local, state resources um, to support this administrative burden. And then finally, um, funding match for grants. Particularly, I think about the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is arguably America's best tool for funding outdoor recreation, but also uh, for the state and local assistance program requires communities to put up a 50% match for the cost. That can be very challenging for rural communities. So again, bringing together collaboratives that are broadly representative can maximize uh, funding opportunities and, and hopefully um, create a nice blended funding mix to uh, allow communities to meet that match requirement. That's all I've got. There's there's um, a couple things in the appendix where there's just some great ideas that didn't fit conveniently elsewhere. And finally, I just wanna highlight examples of outdoor rec collaboratives. So I've been talking about these collaboratives as place-based um, groups that unite economic development groups, nonprofits, local leaders, outdoor businesses, state and federal officials, et cetera. So if you're looking for some inspiration about how this has been done in other places, um, this part of the toolkit is really useful. So just various collaboratives in different parts of the country. Awesome. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and bring back our esteemed panelists. Uh, as we're talking over the next 15 to 20, uh, please put your questions, um, I guess, in the bottom of the screen, and we will make time for your questions as well. We're lucky to have two very outstanding panelists, and I'd love for each of them to just describe what they do uh, for their community and, and how that supports outdoor rec economy development. Um, so, actually, would you just reiterate your role for those of us, uh, for everyone who's joining the call? Sure. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for walking us through that awesome resource that is the OR Toolkit. Um, yes, I am Axie Navis. I'm the director of the Outdoor Recreation Division, which is housed in New Mexico within the Economic Development Department. And to sum up what we do, I'd say our, our goal is to really make sure that all New Mexicans benefit from what we're talking about here, the sustainable outdoor recreation economy, that they see the benefits from a public health standpoint, from an education standpoint, from an economic standpoint, from an environmental standpoint. And so what that looks like in practice revolves around all of those key impact areas. I won't get into that right now, but I know we'll be talking about some more of those specifics later on in this presentation. Thanks, Axie. And, and Councillor Vasquez, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Axie. It's good to be here with both of you guys, um, as well as all our guests. Uh, I'm a city councillor here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and um, I was uh, instrumental in helping to create our, actually our local, our municipal outdoor rec coordinator position, um, almost in tandem with the creation of the New Mexico Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, as well as helped create the New Mexico Outdoor Equity Fund. Prior to that, I worked on forest management plans. I helped create a couple of outdoor rec projects in rural communities like the Cosmic Campground. Um, I uh, am an avid, you know, out, outdoor enthusiast. I hunt, I fish, I camp. Um, 
uh, I've started rafting. Um, a couple of things I won't do just because I've had not great experiences. Uh, let's just say the, they involve the snow uh, because I'm, <laughs> I'm in Southern New Mexico. We don't get too much. Um, uh, so yeah, I get a little dinged up doing some of that stuff. But um, I, in general, I am just a huge supporter and proponent of what the outdoor recreation economy can do to help diversify our state's dependence on um, on, on oil and gas. And um, I'm here to help provide some solutions and some guidance. Wonderful. Well, I, I thought that I would start with you, Councillor Vasquez. Your, your work has always put community first, whether it's in your current role as a city councillor or in leadership at the Nuestra Tierra Conservation Project. And one thing that really stuck out to me from our conversation is the importance of community-centric approaches to economic development that really respect a community's culture and traditions and demographics and values. So could you share more about your observations on what makes a successful grassroots effort and how the New Mexicans on this call can incorporate these practices in building outdoor rec economies? Absolutely, and I'll start with an example here from my community. Uh, and it's one called the Monumental Loop. It's a, it's over 400 miles of uh, a bikeable slash walkable trail that connects all segments of the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument um, that does a loop around Doña Ana County. And so it goes out of our urban community or urban hub in Las Cruces and into rural communities, agricultural communities um, like Anthony and Mesquite and Vado um, and near Chaparral. Uh, and that was actually created, that route, the entire route was created by local cyclists, mountain bikers, and gravel riders um, who saw this potential, right, to develop like something unique, a trail that people would come to and would want to ride. Um, it's obviously a super long trail, so people end up riding different segments of the trail, um, but they've coined different segments of the trail with different nicknames, and so you can ride different segments. Mm -hmm. um, right now, they are actually working on, on a, Nash, uh, on a um, uh, congressional designated trail designation uh, but what's ended up happening is that the community has really embraced this uh, monumental loop. And so now there's branding, there's stickers, um, uh, you know, there's a whole community of folks. Um, I was on a bike ride pre-COVID, obviously, with about 100 people at one point um, to promote mm. the, this, this monumental loop. And so um, that's really one good example of how grassroots built efforts um, can really bud uh, in different communities. Um, I actually just got a message the other day, and she may be on the webinar today, um, from uh, from a, a woman named Nicole, who was talking about this climbing area that's super popular um, up near the Holloman Tunnel in Otero County as you go into uh, the Lincoln National Forest, where I always see tons of climbers. Um, it's probably one of the most dangerous places to climb because uh, you're like right on Highway 82 and, and like the parking area is like non-existent. And so she said, hey, you know, how can we actually build a safe place for people to park, perhaps have some facilities, because people want to come and they want to climb here. Um, the last one I'll mention is the Cosmic Campground. And the Cosmic Campground was the one I was involved in, um, in the Gila National Forest in Catron County. Um, for folks who know Catron County, uh, Catron County is, is one of the more conservative counties in the entire country, really. Um, it's honestly the birthplace of, you know, like the Sagebrush Rebellion. Uh, but it's also home to the Gila National Forest and places um, like the Catwalk National Historic Trail. Now, when the Catwalk was shut down uh, because of a historic flood that ended up destroying all the infrastructure there, um, the town of Glenwood in Catron County was really suffering because they didn't really understand what kind of impact the Catwalk National Historic Trail had in, on their community until it was gone. And so this, these, these uh, local astronomers, a pair of astronomers, Albert and Ann Grauer, from Silver City, um, they did this analysis of the darkest places in all of America. And it turns out like the darkest place in the entire Southwest is, is up there near, Catch in near Glenwood in Catron County. And so they said, this would be the perfect place to establish an international dark sky certified campground where people could come and do astrophotography, night sky photography. Um, you know, they could do all kinds of night sky activities. And um, the Catron County Commission uh, had to write a letter to the Forest Service basically saying, yes, this is an asset that we want in our community in order for the Forest Service to actually build it into their forest management plan and say, hey, we will not build anything around this cosmic campground to make sure that there's no light pollution there. It's now a super popular place where people from all over the country come to this tiny little town, a couple hundred people, 
in Glenwood, New Mexico. And now they get two attractions because the catwalk's been rebuilt. The Cosmic Campground is there. Um, so they get different types of visitors. But um, those are some of the examples of, of the grassroots efforts to really create these outdoor recreation activities um, that are sensitive to the needs and the cultures of those particular areas. Um, I'll mention just a few, a few more, just for example. Um, here in, in Daniana County, the Horny Toad Hustle, uh, the Sierra Vista Trail Runs, um, the Raft the Rio. Uh, in Arizona, further down to the south, also in a very rural and um, uh, conservative area, the Patagonia Sonoita, um, uh, it's kind of a bird hunter's paradise. It's just become this amazing area for quail hunting. Um, uh, so I'll just, uh, yeah, mention a few of those grassroots efforts that really came from the community. Thank you, Chris. Okay, those examples are fantastic. And, and what I hear is, in each case, um, very place-based efforts to understand the values of the community and build on existing amenities to create some very unique outcomes. Um, Axie, I don't know if you have any other uh, reflections on the components of a successful grassroots effort. No, I just add one more. Um, and I would say that those are all really inspiring. Thank you for mentioning them, Gabe. Definitely want, makes me wanna go ride the monumental loop this spring and anyone who's listening should definitely do so as well. Um, and just like get out and check out all the amazing outdoor opportunities that New Mexico has to offer. Um, but I wanna, I'll, I'll step back with a little bit more of a 30,000 foot view at another like truly grassroots effort, but, but that now has statewide impact. And that's the Outdoor Equity Fund. And Gabe, um, Councilor Vasquez is a co-founder of that really innovative grant program as is Representative Angelica Rubio, also from the southern part of the state, um, also an incredible cyclist, if anyone wants to go ride the monumental loop with her, good luck keeping up. Um, but the Outdoor Equity Fund is, is really a homegrown effort, and, and Gabe can talk about it, um, you know, with, with, with his vision for how he created it. But, but I just want to say, like, I'm so proud to be able to be part of the execution of this and to see how it has flourished from the grassroots vision really in um i think like las cruces doña anna and then broader and then how that has affected the state as a whole so you have this grassroots vision to say how do we get kids outside how do we benefit the the young new mexicans in this state and make sure that we think intentionally and proactively about tearing down those barriers that we know exist to getting outside and doing all those great activities that that we've talked about here fly fishing hunting um snow sports skiing whatever it is how do we as a state help take down those barriers and that's what i think of as, as something that came about through a grassroots effort now has statewide impact and is really again about building capacity in each of these communities so it's almost like this cycle that it's this unique idea to new mexico administered now by the state, but the idea is community capacity building, again, at that grassroots level. So I think you can think about it from all these awesome like infrastructure and community projects that the counselor has spoken about, as well as some of these like really innovative programs that are unique to the state as a whole, but have true community impact. So just a shout out to all the great work that Councillor Vasquez and, and others have done to make that a reality. Amazing. And I also uh, just want to reemphasize if any questions are coming to the front of your mind as, as the three of us are chatting, please feel free to um, share them in the chat or question box at the bottom of the screen. I want to transition the conversation into how communities can take advantage of uh, state and local resources. If you could, too, could talk a bit about like how can communities approach you for support and what sort of support do you all have, whether it's in the city of Las Cruces and other towns and cities across New Mexico or at the state level? And, and maybe Axie um, can take this one first. Sure, I'll try and keep it kind of top level. And then I'm also here to answer any specific questions folks might have if something that I say really rings a bell with them, maybe it really resonates and seems like it would be helpful in your community. Um, but a lot of what we do is essentially be like the connective tissue between some of these resources at the municipal, county, state, and federal level within New Mexico to build an outdoor recreation economy in a sustainable way. So what that can look like, I think, is like technical assistance. Um, it looks like relationship building, um, brainstorming sessions, throwing spaghetti at the wall of what might be right for your community. It means connecting community leaders with all these great grants, loans, and other 
other easy to access capital options that are both hosted within economic development department and then in some of our sister agencies, making sure that individuals, be it um, a community leader or a business leader, um, someone at the, at the municipal county or, or local other local government entities are connected to those resources. So that's really how I think about our role is to help be the guide within this network and matrix of opportunities to build sustainable outdoor recreation economies in New Mexico. And we wanna either connect people directly with programs within the outdoor recreation division that might help or make sure that you are empowered to see where those other programs might exist at all sorts of levels of, of government. And so that's the big picture. A few of the specific programs that we are really proud of, again, the Outdoor Equity Fund. That is a grant to build capacity among local governments, nonprofits to get kids outside. So if you fall into that category and are interested in that, please let me know. Check out our website, nmoutside.com to learn more about it. That's a very concrete example of a resource that we want to that we offer and we want to keep growing. It's something I am super proud of to be able to work underneath those auspices. We also have an infrastructure grant and that Chris mentioned sometimes the difficulty of communities to meet, for example, the Land and Water Conservation Fund match. This grant in particular is intended to help alleviate that challenge. So it's a grant that goes to those same eligible entities, um, municipalities, counties, nonprofits to build outdoor recreation infrastructure in your community. And I think that's that can be a wonky term for anything from a public shooting range to a boat ramp to a hiking trail to trailhead improvements. So I, the list goes on, I think, in terms of some other really concrete resources we offer. But I'd say think about us as a, as a hub to ask questions, to lean on when you're growing the outdoor recreation economy, and then keep some of those specific grant programs in mind when you're actually trying to grow access within your community to New Mexico's incredible outdoors. Exactly. Any additional thoughts from you, Councillor Vasquez? Uh, you know, on that note, I'll just say that at the municipal level, um, I would, you know, figure out what your city, what your county has going on in terms of, um, are there plans for trail development? Are there plans for multimodal paths? Are there plans for things that would um, create local opportunities for outdoor recreation um, that would also attract, you know, uh, visitors and out-of-towners. And so for us, you know, we do, we are lucky that we do have an outdoor rec coordinator. So if somebody has an idea of an outdoor recreation activity or destination, we actually have a person who is kind of dedicated to, to facilitating those conversations and those solutions. And then there's all kinds of other local financing mechanisms that you can do to build parks or open spaces or trails, things like geo bonds, right? Our, our last geo bond package, um, general obligation bond package, uh, package here in Las Cruces, um, actually the voters voted to use a quarter of that money to build a, um, a multimodal trail system throughout the entire mm -hmm. city to complete the trail. That was, that was the voters will, but it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have people from the community coming to us and saying this is important. Such great examples, Councillor. And I, I'm starting to see some great uh, questions from the audience. And uh, I'd like to bring one forward about this thing called a SCORP. And I think, Axie, you're a, a great person to talk about what a SCORP is, why it's important, and how community members can be involved in the planning process. Yeah, great, Chris, and great question. Um, Yes, the state of New Mexico is currently in the midst of the SCORP planning process, statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. That is a plan that is led by our awesome state parks division. And I'm grateful that the outdoor recreation division can, can have a seat at that table and help shape that strategy. And that's really what it is. It's a long-term strategy for outdoor recreation priorities in New Mexico. And so it's a really important tool for the public, I think, to have their voice be heard when it comes to setting that agenda and then specifically crafting those priorities as they pertain, again, to land and water conservation fund money, making sure that the state is clear on its priorities for outdoor recreation as a whole and then how they dovetail with federal funding opportunities like the LWCF. So it's really good timing to talk about it. We actually have our public town hall meeting scheduled for March 25th at 5 p.m. Um, that information is on our website. 
and I can also follow up with folks after this, but it's just, it's an important save the date. If you're interested in the SCORE process, tune in to that virtual town hall later this month and learn about where things stand and have your voice be heard in this big um, planning process that's gonna have long-term impacts for New Mexico's outdoor recreation economy. And to add to that, I'm reminded of um, a reflection in the toolkit where uh, a, at least a, a few folks that I interviewed mentioned that in the process of creating these SCORPs, um, states can uh, effectively integrate state goals for public health and economic development so that future grant applications resonate with a broader range of elected officials. So just to reiterate the top line from what Axie just said, SCORP is a great way to have your voice heard. It's a necessary component of getting land and water conservation fund funding and is renewed on a multi-year cycle and you're in that process right now. So um, engaging with the New Mexico Outdoor Rec Division is a great opportunity to do that. Um, there were a couple um, more specific questions. Someone asked about uh, golf courses, and I'll just note that golf courses that have public benefit are eligible for LWCF funding. Um, golf courses are represented in ORR membership in the Sports and Fitness Industry Association, uh, so they are an important part of the outdoor rec um, puzzle. And there's also a great question about a, a small group presentation, and I, I I'll leave that to Axie to think about, but that's exactly the sort of question that should be asked after a presentation like this, is like, how do we get the right folks around the table to talk about the potential of outdoor rec economies to benefit our community and do so uh, at, you know, as specifically as we can to our community's needs? Uh, let's see this question. I'm just processing in action. It's hard for our community to pursue trails, campgrounds, et cetera, when we need clean drinking water and broadband access for visitors and businesses. Will infrastructure grants cover these types of projects? Um, that makes me think of all the great uh, grants coming out of the USDA. Um, I'm not like a specialist by any means in what USDA can provide, but for sure in terms of clean drinking water and broadband access, that's definitely in their portfolio of, of grants and technical assistance. And I encourage you to look at that broad list of uh, funding resources that's included in the toolkit. Actually, I don't know, or, or Councillor Vasquez, if you have any other comments on the infrastructure grants question. Uh, I'll just add that, um, so with every administration comes a different appointment to USDA rural development um, uh, to the direct, to the state director. And each director has a, has different priorities based on uh, what the administration's priorities are. And I will say that um, I am confident and uh, completely uh, excited that uh, under this administration, providing things like broadband, um, like wastewater uh, uh, projects, um, like you know even just water projects in general for um, especially for for tribal communities will be a priority for USDA rural development. They give out um, somewhere between one to one point five billion dollars in funding in New Mexico every year. Um, and that is in the form of grants and loans to local governments, to utilities, to school districts. Um, so it's really flexible. So that's one of the major sources of funding. But of course, there's also, you know, state capital outlay funding um, where you can contact your state representative. And um, oftentimes with their junior money or when there's capital outlay money, you're able to fund some of these projects, um, which are priority projects anytime it comes to infrastructure. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think you can do both. Um, obviously, having the type of amenities in a rural community that might attract a visitor um, should come second to having the type of infrastructure that you need just for your local community to have the basic needs met. Um, but I think there's a strategy where you could perhaps do both of those together. Um, oftentimes, people ask us here at the city, like, hey, why are you, why are you digging up the street every two years? And we're like, oh, because now we got to put fiber optic lines under the street. And you know, two years ago, we had to uh, replace the copper water lines that we had. So now as a city, we try to do everything at once. Every Anytime we dig up a street, we put every all the infrastructure that needs to go in there um, to meet everybody's needs. So um, uh, it's a good practice to kind of think about all those needs ahead of time. Councillor, thanks for giving us a, a quick crash course in the public funding process. That's, that's super helpful. Um, I, I have another question on on my list that I'm hoping the three of us can kind of brainstorm together. You know, there's there's um, valid concerns about the development of outdoor rec economies 
that I think have been informed by just certain examples across the country where you got a huge influx of tourists, it's strange local infrastructure and, and you might lose some community character. And what I'm thinking about is, is like, how can communities plan proactively for um, these sorts of stresses potentially? How can communities build an economy that works for everyone? Um, I don't know if, if Axie or Gabe um, have uh, comments on that. Sure, I can jump in real quick. Um, I, again, I think back to this holistic approach that I think we, we must take and like following Councillor Vasquez's leadership and even what he's just articulating here with this approach of thinking about kind of tiers of infrastructure and how can you build it into a package. And also to your point earlier, Chris, rethinking the idea of outdoor recreation access as a amenity and, and really as a necessity for the community. For these places are our offices, they are our classrooms, um, you know, they they are our therapy, they are where we find solace. So I think like keeping that North Star metric in mind as we as we protect these places, as we potentially develop outdoor recreation infrastructure is essential. And I think that's why the Outdoor Equity Fund is the priority of the Outdoor Recreation Division. It's why some of this proactive infrastructure funding is a priority of the Outdoor Recreation Division. How do we how do we ensure that these places are protected in perpetuity? And so I think that has to be kind of foundational to any long-term mm -hmm. strategy work that's that's going forth to work like like the work that's being done in the SCORP. Um, and I'll cite one specific example too that also dovetails with with what the counselor was saying. We're embarking on a new 2021 partnership collaboration with our awesome Main Street team. Main Street is housed within Economic Development Department, but then there's Main Street directors all over the state who are just pros. They're so good at what they do. And we want to think proactively about how do we unite the work that the Main Street directors are doing with all of these incredible surrounding outdoor recreation resources to make sure that any any visitors who are maybe coming to go um, to the Vistai, for example, um, or El Mal Pais, that they're going to go to these places and then they're going to go downtown to Farmington or Shiprock or Aztec, or they're going to go to Grants or they're going to go to Gallup and they're going to spend money and they're going to encourage economic opportunity in those rural communities so that the people who live in those communities actually see economic benefit. And mm -hmm. I think that's that's one example of how we look at this holistically. I'm really excited to, to kind of follow on the coattails of the really great work that the Main Street community does, which is why I flag that for people now. Um, but that's like the type of initiative that we want to keep pushing forward, that it's not just mm -hmm. about, it can't be siloed. It has to be a complete look at, at what the outdoor recreation economy looks like in each community. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100% on that. I think when you provide local opportunity, economic opportunity to local folks, local businesses, and you're very conscious and um, in, in developing that type of outdoor rec economy, you, you will get more buy-in because more dollars will stay in that community. And so something is, as, as simple as uh, getting a fly shop off the ground and I'm going to channel Senator Hamblin here, but, you know, part of what she, the great work that Senator Hamblin did after we enacted Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks National Monument is she created a marketing toolkit for local businesses to actually sell the monument in as part of their products. And so um, there, we have Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks wine. We have Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks cocktails. Uh, we now have a distillery that features like all the um, uh, fauna of, of the Oregon Mountain Desert Peaks on all their bottles called Dry Point Distillers. Um, there's like Oregon Mountain Cupcakes, I mean, there's all these opportunities for local businesses to really take advantage of becoming this recreational hub. Um, as far as saturation goes, well, if you, you know, especially in a rural community where some of the things that, that a visitor might want out of uh, an experience, for example, is like housing, right? Do you have some place to stay that's nearby? And so even working with local property owners to develop things like Airbnbs or short-term rentals so that folks are staying in their communities rather than just driving there and then driving somewhere else to put their dollars in other places are also considerations to make. Um, uh, but yes, making sure that local people get a benefit, an economic benefit, uh, but that also that you respect the will of you know, there's some special places to communities, especially um, in and around tribal nations, right? There's, there's places you don't want 
rock climbing. You don't want mountain climbing. You don't want off-roading that, um, that the community really has taken um, a shared stewardship over. And so being conscious of that as well and, and making sure that you're protecting sensitive areas at the same time that you're promoting um, the outdoor recreation opportunities there is super important. Um, otherwise, people do feel you know like they're being taken advantage of um, mm -hmm. or that their resources aren't being used adequately. Um, I'll, I'll just mention one quick comment here, and this is from Silver City, right? And, and I, I remember being over here again at the bar at Silver City um, a couple of years ago, and somebody, um, a local person there said, you know, we don't want to become the next Santa Fe. You know, and, and that struck me because they said, you know, you're priced out of Santa Fe if you want to live anywhere in the middle of the city. And so also being very conscious about the, the, the opp uh, opportunity or the potential for gentrification um, is really important. And I think some of the housing stuff in the toolkit covers that. But but you never want to create such a elite destination that you that the local folks then don't have um, the, the, their basic needs met completely agree and I'm just going to bring the toolkit back up for a second because there's two sections that um, speak to exactly what these two have been talking about and I was able to speak with Emily Niehaus who's the mayor of Moab Utah and Emily is perhaps best equipped to talk about these sort of stresses um, because of what Moab um, has become for outdoor recreation and she said this it's important to ask these questions of communities if you want to maintain the culture you have today is it going to be a limit to growth? Is it going to be a restriction of commercially zoned parcels? There are ways that communities can lock down size, but it can be difficult to lock down culture. So early collective visioning is super important so that you're creating what you wanna see and avoiding unintended consequences. The language that she used that really stuck with me is zoning for authenticity, whether it's you know physical zoning of development opportunities or just early collective visioning as she describes. So these issues like traffic management, um, housing affordability, affordability, wildlife impacts, new business development, and others should be raised proactively. And, and in the second um, section I wanna highlight is, is the importance of value capture. And this is Molly Feebald from the Appalachian Regional Commission. And, and her quote, I think is really apt. If folks go down trails and camp, but bring their own food and only buy gas that has zero impact on the local economy. We want someone to be able to get off a trail and have an opportunity to spend money on music, arts and crafts, et cetera, so that they can stay a day or two and really invest in the visit. So these examples really just adding some more context and color to the great comments um, from Gabe and Elsie just now. Um, I am conscious of our time. Um, Axie and Gabe, any like last words uh, to the community members who are on the call um, in terms of what they can do next? You know, I would just close by saying, I want to silent cite three of my favorite of these best practices. And one of them is this idea that has come up quite a bit and it's um, lean on your local champions. I, as, a, as someone who sits in a state chair, does that all the time. I look to local leaders to set to, to set priorities and to let me know as a state, as a representative of a state agency, what those priorities are and how we can support them. So that's really how I see our role. And we have some of those resources that I listed earlier to help make that dream a reality. Um, but we really do look to that grassroots support and organizing to push them forward. Um, and then I'd say that generating a public support is such a key part of that too. Councillor Vasquez articulated that really well, just how key that is to getting um, outdoor recreation focused initiatives on the ballot, for instance, or letting local lawmakers know what the priorities are and, and maybe suggesting some routes for capital outlay funding that, that both go to that critical core infrastructure as well as some of these critical outdoor recreation access opportunities. And then, and then finally, I think it's knowing your story and that ties into both brand building, but it also ties into this question of priorities and this holistic approach to the outdoor recreation economy to, to, to make sure that the, the residents in the community see the benefits. And that's not an afterthought, it's, it's foundational to any of the work that we as a state do and I, and I think should be foundational to any of the work a community puts forward within their space. Um, making sure that it is New Mexicans who, who are benefiting in all sorts of different ways from the outdoor recreation work we're talking about here. 
Thanks, Taxi. And I'll just close by saying thank you, Chris. Thank you to the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable um, and to the Outdoor Recreation Division at the Economic Development Department. Um, I'll just say the Outdoor Rec Economy train in New Mexico is moving. Um, it's not going to be stopped anytime soon. It's a, a, it's a terrific way to diversify um, our state's economy, which is badly needed here in New Mexico. Um, outdoor Rec has the potential to transform rural communities in a time where, you know, many of them are being economically devastated for a number of different reasons, including COVID, um, including a transition into clean energy. And so um, there are solutions out there. Um, Axie has done a tremendous job at the helm of this department. And so I look forward to seeing so much more progress. Please follow um, Outdoor Rec and um, uh, the Division of Outdoor Rec on social media to see what more what more is going on. And and the Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. Uh, but more than anything, yeah, please do use this resource, this Rural Economic Development Toolkit, and see what opportunities exist in, in your community, um, especially if you're from a rural part of the state. Thank you. Thanks to all for making time for this call. Uh, would love to connect further. Feel free to email me at cperkins at recreationroundtable.org, connect on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, whatever it might be. Councilor Vasquez, Axie, thanks so much for your time, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Counselor.